Good evening and welcome to Bible study tonight on this wonderful evening in June here in Charlotte, North Carolina, the Queen City of the South. Hi, I'm Pastor Kimbrough from Mount Carmel Baptist Church here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Let me thank you for joining us tonight. And let me thank our beloved Mount Carmel family for sharing tonight. We look forward to a wonderful study and we so appreciate your support and your love and your prayers. Let's begin by praying together. God, we still ourselves in your presence and we thank you for this wonderful evening. We thank you for the gift of life and the joys and celebrations, the mountains, the valleys, the many challenges. And we thank you most of all for the lo loving presence of God, for God is love and love is the presence of God. And so we thank you today. We bless every home and every heart and mind that is tuned in tonight. Help us to be fertile ground, uh, good soil for the word of God, which is God's great seed as he sows in us. We thank you, we remember our nation, we remember families who are grieving, we remember communities who are hurting. We pray for greater healing, greater wholeness, greater restoration, greater peace, and most of all, a greater presence of God and God's love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we're gonna jump right into it tonight. We are in the book of Acts. We are teaching through the book of Acts. We are in chapter nine, chapter nine, toward the latter part of that chapter. And today we'll begin in verse number 32. That's Acts chapter nine, beginning at verse number 32. And there you find these words recorded. Now, as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints who lived at Lydia. There he found a man named Aeneas, be written for eight years, who was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose, and all the residents of Lydia and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. And they turned to the Lord. Peter is last mentioned, was last mentioned in Acts 8, chapter 8, in verse number 25. Now, when they had testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel to the many villages of Samaria. That's Acts 8, 25. And so Peter was last mentioned in this eighth chapter. Peter has become an itinerant preacher. He is moving around Judea, which has brought him to Lydia. And he is carrying a message, of course, a ministry of word. It is an extensive work. We're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5, we do not have the right to take along a believing wife also do the other apostles and brothers of the Lord and Cephas. And so we read that because it demonstrates that he was moving about teaching and preaching the gospel. Now, now Philip had preceded him in this arena, this area. And so now uh, Peter arrives as Peter went here and there among them all, as he was preaching around, he came down also, it says, to the saints who lived in Lydia. There he found a man whose name was Aeneas, Aeneas be written, bedridden for eight years and who was paralyzed. Uh, given the amount of time that is detailed in the narrative, it is clear that this man is known in this area. He's known by the saints and 
also others in the area. And let me just stop for a moment. When we talk about saints or uh, sainthood, that's a phrase uh, that was used to uh, demonstrate that one is uh, set apart for uh, the work of God. So here in this community, this man is known uh, and his preaching has attracted people. They began to take notice of him. And this miracle is used and given as a way that it might be a amplification of the work of God. So the work of God is already going on. We are visual creatures while we are spiritual creatures in a flesh body, our tendency is to focus, unfortunately, more on the flesh world, the physical world, while we are seeking to heighten our spiritual awareness. And I'm certain that God is aware of this and the miracle here is given not simply to demonstrate that God has power to heal a paralyzed man. There's no doubt that God has that kind of power. The question here is, is God moving with Peter? Is God's spirit present? present? Is God with him and with this movement? And so here, there's a man who was bedridden for eight years, was paralyzed, and Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Rise and make your bed. And immediately he rose. And all the residents of Lydia and Sharon saw him. And the key here is, and they turned to the Lord and they turned to the Lord. And so this miracle is Peter's second healing of someone who is crippled. In chapter three of Acts, verse one and 10. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that was called Beautiful Gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him, and as did John, and said, Look on us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from both. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And so here is the second miracle, the second demonstration of God's power working through Peter and through Peter's presence. It is the power of God that provides the healing. And again, I do want to emphasize that the focus here is in verse number 35. And all the residents of Lydia and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. They turned to the Lord in otherwise uh, it was through this miracle, this great act, that it garnered their attention. And because their attention was now turned to God, they were now receptive to what God had for them by way of the gift of relationship or what we traditionally call salvation. And many times God has to get our attention through the activities of life and work in the context of our relationships to challenge us and to see the places in our lives where we need to get closer to God, where we need to be drawn closer to Him. 
And so don't just pray for a miracle for God to fix the situation outside of yourself. Perhaps a better prayer is God help me to see the miracle of God that is already present in my life. Everything you have, God has already provided. Our biggest challenge is not going to find it, it's here. Our biggest challenge is becoming aware and seeing what is right in front of us and then being able to activate or to walk in the kingdom on a regular basis, to go and to be faithful to that and not to flow in and out, to ebb and flow with the life of the Spirit. We're trying to become more faithful to our spiritual walk every day. Let me encourage you to start your day off, even if it's just five minutes, uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, with focused prayer, with focus acknowledgement of asking God, asking God's love to guide you throughout that day that will help you to make the right decisions. It will help you to order your words. It will help you to become more patient, more kind, and more willing to share with others, not from a place of anger or a place of fear, but from a place of God's love. And so this miracle calls their attention, and many of them, many of them, here it says all the residents turned to the Lord. And so we have this first miracle, and then we have a second miracle listed here in verse number 36. Now there was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translates means Dorcas. She was full of good works and acts of charity. In those days, she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in the upper room. And since Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, Please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when they arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and kneeled down and prayed. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. And then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. There it is again, that same phrase. And many believed in the Lord, and he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon of Tanner, with one Simon of Tanner. And so while Peter was in Lydia, a beloved Christian woman, a woman we are told and is told and is called a disciple. So while he's in Joppa, a disciple, that's important, what is a disciple? A disciple is a follower, a student. That means she was a follower, a student of Jesus, named Tabitha, who has distinguished herself by her good works and acts of charity. We are told that uh, her Greek name is Tabitha, I'm sorry, uh, Tabitha is her Aramaic name, uh, gazelle in Greek, uh, that Dorcas died. She was known for helping the poor, and because these two cities were close together, they were only about 12 miles apart, men were able to go and send for Peter, and they sent from Joppa 
to call him. Now, interesting enough, uh, the text doesn't tell us what their expectations were. They just knew that Peter was there. They knew that great works followed Peter. And up to this point, uh, there has been no evidence or no example of anyone being raised from the dead in the early church. Of course, that exception of Jesus, but the disciples have not demonstrated this power. And so by faith, they sin for him. And when they sin for him, they sin for him, I don't think they truly understood, or maybe they did. Maybe there was a great expectation that he could call her back. Maybe they thought his presence would comfort them and comfort the church. But for whatever reason, they sent for Peter. And in doing so, we're told that uh, when he arrived, so Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room and all the widows stood beside him weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. So Peter arrives, and he arrives into a situation of mourning and grief. We are told that the widows there are weeping. We are told they lead him to the upper room, that there in the upper room that uh, Peter then does something extraordinary. Peter put them all outside, kneeled down and prayed, and turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. Notice he does not touch the body because it would be unclean for Jewish male to touch a dead body. So he simply speaks. And when he speaks, we are told that this miracle happens. This miraculous event takes place. That in doing so, and she opened up her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she set up. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. That's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful story. And so here, this miracle again is evidence, this miracle of resurrection. And the gift of resurrection is the greatest physical miracle that we see in this arena. All right, Dorcas is brought back to life, emblematic as Jesus uh, was brought back to life. But it now demonstrates that the disciples now have, watch this, the same power that Jesus himself demonstrated. I, I want you to get that. What that means is that the power of God that is free and flowing in the universe was now accessible to the disciples. And so in doing so, they were able to become conduits of the presence of God's power. Now, God's power is life. Life. And to be a conduit of that is to speak life, to model life, to be a life bearer, to be a person who lifts people up, to be a person who speaks life into others. And so this is an important event in the gospel. For again, it affirms that God's not only presence, but God's miraculous power is with Peter. It 
also demonstrates through the miracle. Notice what happens. Many believed in the Lord, and it became known throughout Joppa. And he stayed in Joppa for many days with Simon, one Simon, a tanner. And so many came to believe in the Lord through this miracle. And I sense that that's what God does in our lives, that our lives are simply an instrument for many to come and to know that God is real. I'm quite sure that you've seen people or you've heard people say, or maybe they've even said it about you. I don't know. Well, if God can do that, surely God is real. Maybe you've seen somebody whose life's circumstances or situations were so far beyond any reasonable change and yet you see them at a later point and you see the evidence of God's miraculous power. And so really these miracles are designed so that we will come to know and trust in God by faith that God is with us. God does not come and go and leave and sometimes with us, maybe here, no, no, always with us. And faith affirms that. Rather, I can see the benefit or the blessing of God, or I can't see it. It does not mean that God has left me or that God has forsaken me. The power of God, the gift of the Holy Spirit. We live in the age of the Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is with us always. And so here, this great miracle confirms that Peter, and through Peter's experience, that this is evidence that God is with him. So here we have two outstanding miracles confirming God's presence, God's ministry with and through Peter in a very special way. He is ministering in the area that is uh, partially Gentile. He now moves to, it says, living in the home of Simon the Tanner. All right, Tanner is considered to be, uh, Tanners are considered to be ceremonially unclean which um, means that they were in constant contact with skins of dead animals. And you can read that in Leviticus 11 and 40, that no one was to touch the carcasses um, and uh, be in association with these dead animals. Well, guess what? And he stayed in Joppa for many days with one Simon, a tanner. So Simon Tanner worked with dead carcasses. It's believed that um, it was, uh, he was seen as unclean by Jewish standards. And Peter in this region stays with him, which now helps us to see how the gospel again continues to spread and continues to move forward. Now we're getting ready to get to Cornelius and this story of Cornelius uh, is lengthy. It has several parts and it is a pivotal story in God shifting, or I shouldn't say shifting, God expanding the greater vision of the gospel in our world. I think most of us agree and affirm that the gospel was given for all people. And by all people, I mean all people. People we agree with, people we disagree with. People who we think have it all together and people who we think can't figure out which way to go. 
And it's very humbling because our temptation is often to cast our worldview on other people. And this is why it's important that we pray for patience, pray for more love and understanding. Um, love and understanding doesn't make you weak, it makes you strong. It gives you the capacity to move to a place of non-judgment on people. It's not your job, it's not my job to offer judgment on anybody. It is our task in God to offer God's love and to be an agent of healing, an agent of healing. It starts in our homes, it starts in our relationships, it starts in our community. And when we are agents of healing, agents of love, then our witness will be magnified. Then our witness will be expanded. And so if you really want to know how does one create miracles in one's life, it begins fundamentally with the love of God residing in you. A miracle is not simply something you pray for and God strikes like lightning on the outside. A miracle starts with your own spiritual turning to God and seeking to live every day and ultimately every hour and then ultimately every moment. And few get there, to be quite honest. Maybe the great spiritual giants will get there. But most of us, as we walk this life, we seek that and we get hints and touches of it. And then we will slide back or we'll hear uh, the other voice will talk to us. And that voice will pull us and say, well, maybe you can't trust God in this situation. Maybe God's not paying attention. Just enough to raise a question. Just enough to cause you to question your faith. Just enough to cause you to question God's faithfulness to you. And so, beloved, I want to say to you that continue to grow and continue to nurture your faith. We live by faith and not by sight. And the fundamental of faith says that God is with me. God is with me when it's raining, and God is with me when the sun is shining. God is with me when there is evidence of miracles flowing in my life, and God is with me when my life feels barren and empty. God is with me when I feel the anointing of God and the fresh wind of God's Holy Spirit, and God is with me when my soul feels barren and neglected and isolated and alone. We've all known these conditions, but in every condition, God is seeking to raise us up, to understand that the words are true. I will never leave you, and I will never forsake you. Lo, I am with you always. I like that. Lo, I am with you always, always even until the end of the world. And so we are in God's hands, beloved. We are in God's hands. And so I think I want to stop there today. I don't want to try to launch into Cornelius because it's such a lengthy story. And I really want to take the time to walk us through it as we see this major shift with Peter and this great inclusion of the larger Gentile world as the gospel begins to ripple through the land. And as people are turning, as the story said tonight, are turning and turning and turning to God by evidence of not only the preachment and the teaching, but now also the evidence of miracles that follow Peter. Now, if you're blessed with a miracle, remember the miracle is not just for you. The miracle is to give evidence 
of the reality and the presence of a living God. Somebody was sharing with me a testimony uh, just yesterday by way of phone and said, Pastor, uh, did you hear about my miracle? And they shared it with me, and I'm not going to call their name because I don't want to put anybody on the spot, what had happened. And they shared uh, with me how God had brought them through a situation and blessed them. And they were absolutely right because that situation was simply evidence that God is with us, that God is real. And I know you can look in your own life and see many examples of the miracle working power of God. And if by chance you say, I've never seen a miracle, I've never had a miracle, I, I don't understand it, I want you to pray for your opening of your mind. Pray that God's Holy Spirit would open your mind and open your eyes to see the miraculous work of God all around us. Thank you, beloved, for joining us tonight. It's been a beautiful study, and I look forward to us gathering on next week. Let's pray as we conclude tonight. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the miracles of God that all around us that are with us. We bless each person who tuned in today and whatever needs are resident by way of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot be limited by technology, cannot be shut out by doors or windows, cannot be locked out by bars. And so God, right now, Holy Spirit, if you will travel to all the places you need to go and be who you are, you are our great healer, our great advocate. You are even with God now, example of the amplification of God's love. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we give all honor and glory in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. And again, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And we look forward to our continual journey together. Remember, stay safe. Don't get in a hurry. Stay safe. We're seeing a resurgence of things. Stay healthy. Watch your health. Follow your protocols. Wear your mask. Practice social distancing. Wear gloves if you have them. So stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. Trust God. Believe in God. Continue to do your morning prayers. Continue to do your meditation. Continue to check in with God early in the morning before you start your day. Stay faithful. And lastly, stay blessed. Walk in the blessing of Christ. Walk in the favor of God, knowing that God loves you. All right, beloved, share the love. Share the love. Share the love. God bless you and have a wonderful, wonderful evening.